So on to just um, talking about climate justice. And I'm going to start, I've not, I've not got a PowerPoint, but I am going to share pictures as we go along because uh, often they can be, they can be quite, a, they appeal to the emotions and they can sort of reach our hearts better. Um, and I'm going to go back to some basics before I talk about some of the things that, that we do. So let me just bear with me as um, I slowly share content from my screen. Okay, so Zoom is making this a lot more difficult than I had thought. Let me try it. Uh, there we go, let's do this. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so this is this is working. Right, so why climate justice? Well, I'm going to start by showing you this, this world map and it becomes very obvious which areas of the world are going to be deeply uh, affected by climate change if the world gets to four degrees. But I say that with a caveat that, of course, we all recognise that climate change is having an impact on some of the countries that are marked in yellow and brown already. But if we were to let climate change go unchecked along the trajectory that we currently have, this is the kind of habitable areas in green that we will um, have. And we are looking really in yellow and brown at the areas that have the most vulnerable people already. Many people with black and brown skins and the poorest of the poor. So that is the primary reason why I think um, we all um, need to take this issue incredibly seriously. And of course, this reminder comes from our, um, our talk, which if you haven't seen or done it, then um, we can always um, send you a copy if you want to do it in in your church. But we are, of course, commanded to love our neighbour. The primary commandment of all Christians is to love God and to love our neighbour. And here's another one just to remind us of the basics of why we do this. And I'm just going to sit with that for a moment. I don't think I need to say anything about that. So what is climate justice? Well, a few years ago, a group of NGOs, including Oxfam, put out something called Fair Shares. And this is part of that leaflet. And it's quite a good explainer about the basics of what um, is obvious about what climate justice is about. So it's about taking responsibility for our historic emissions. It involves uh, assessing the financial capacity of countries to withstand climate change, and it involves a moral responsibility. And it also involves justice for all. So we talk about climate justice as if it was limited to the justice for countries that are currently on the front line of climate crisis. And that's a really important one, but we mustn't forget that there are 
elements. In fact, one missing from this slide, which I borrowed from the XR um, Heading for Extinction talk, like intergenerational justice. Justice is justice for all, and we have to broaden our thinking around climate justice and remember that there are many ways that people are vulnerable or that we need justice in the face of what's happening in the climate crisis. And some of it is racial justice, but it's also social justice. It's about your uh, ethnicity, it's about your class, it's about your gender, it's about your access to health care and to finance, to your environment around you. We know that um, as we head through this century, predictions are that more than 75% of humanity will live in cities. What does justice look like for people who live in cities that are um, some of the most polluted areas? And um, we can see that there's a huge intersectionality between all these. Uh, often, if you're black and brown, you live in places where uh, the environment is particularly poor. You will have less access to health justice. Um, and if you're a woman in those um, it, it, who's black and brown, then your um, call to justice might be even more strong than someone who is perhaps black or brown and uh, has access to economic resources. So those are all the sorts of things that we need to bear in mind when we talk about climate justice. And when we talk about climate justice as the climate movement, and we do this, I think, in Christian Climate Action as much as anyone else, we only tell half the story. We, we talk about tackling the climate and ecological crisis. And we say we must stop fossil fuel extraction. Um, we must um, reduce our emissions. But I think when you think about climate justice and those slides that I've just put up, you can see that they really only tell half the story because it's not just about tackling it, it's about how we tackle it. If we tackle the climate and ecological emergency without considering the effects on, on the poor, on the marginalized, I think we lose sight of God's justice. Because if, for instance, we demand divestment from fossil fuel funders, from uh, fossil fuel producers, without demanding an equal investment in the good things and the things that we need to change, then we haven't done our job properly. And often we stop at the end of the first part and we don't talk about the second part. And part of the reason for that, I think, is because we're afraid that it becomes really political. And it becomes party political. But whatever side of politics you are on, that second side is, is vastly important to the people that we talk about when we talk about climate justice. For them, it's not enough that we start to bring down emissions and temperatures. That, that will make a considerable difference to their lives. But what about the harm that's already built in? What about the fact that they will continue to experience the effects of what we've done, regardless of what we do going forward. And part of this is about how we share resources that involve protection and resilience for these uh, groups, not just the countries, but also all these other groups that I've talked about. And we, we often talk about that as mitigation or adaptation. We need to provide technology and resources to help people and groups mitigate and adapt for, for climate change. But we also have to look at the question of loss and damage, which is a separate area. And 
loss and damage is around the things that you can't change through mitigation and adapt adaptation. It's about the fact that there are people whose livelihoods have gone, whose cities, towns, farms are disappearing, who helps them, who helps their countries, who helps their communities to rebuild. And that is a part of what we overall call climate finance. And that's one of the biggest campaigns we mount in, or we're beginning to think about and, and doing in uh, Christian climate action in terms of climate justice, because it's so directly connected with what's with the climate crisis and what's happening at the moment. And when we talk about it, or when I talk about it, I, I regularly tell people, we need to look at climate finance as a debt. And developed nations owe this debt to developing ones on lots of bases. So the first is, of course, we've used up the climate budget. There's virtually nothing left. And it's more than our fair share of that climate budget. The ability of nature to withstand increased emissions, to De environmental degradation is so diminished there's only a tiny bit left before we are at um, a point of pretty much no return and so we owe them the debt of not using any more of it up but also returning what we can to the environment but also helping them to be more resilient in the face of the fact they've got nothing left but we also i think owe them a debt which re requires us to think a bit more deeply and it really is a very uh, difficult issue politically for many people. So we have to think about how we address this. But it is vital, I think, to acknowledge that the reason that we're able to be in the position where we can withstand the climate crisis and they can't is because we've asset stripped a lot of these countries. From the point of the Industrial Revolution, we've caused the climate crisis. But if we look further back from that, we look to say slavery as an example. The money from slavery kickstarted the Industrial Revolution and brought about the climate crisis, but it also took away some of the biggest assets that countries in West Africa had. And then we went on to use that position of power in colonial times to take out natural resources from these countries and never to build the infrastructure that enable them to prosper from their natural resources. Instead, um, you know, we've got cotton mills as an example, but lots of our trade is based on what we got from these countries. So there's a huge, huge complex web of connections that makes up this debt that we owe them. And it's not, you know, we all say you pay your debts. And instead, we suppress them under really punitive arrangements around global loan systems, hampering even more their ability to withstand this sort of impact from climate uh, finance. And there's, it seems to me that there's another way that we um, kind of make this worse. We currently um, export things like arms and arms trade we know makes uh, and conflict makes climate vulnerable countries even more climate vulnerable makes them so much less resilient to be able to offset the effects of climate change if they're in a conflict zone and so there's another connection to be made we import loads of things from other countries so even though our own emissions might look better than other countries we've effectively outsourced them by buying our goods and from from china and relying on a service economy i think that in in a in a, in a session of this um length we we can't go into the deep tentacles and I'm just going to invite you to think about this and maybe to do some of your own research around it. But I think those are conversations that we must have in connection with our climate justice campaigning. And I think the other thing that 
we need to look at is really embedding that into all our actions. We do do specific actions related to climate justice, and I think we need to continue doing that, and I'm going to showcase a few of them in a minute. But I think that we need to think about how we could bed this into all the actions we do. So I said I'd show you some, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to my rather ham-fisted slide sharing here. Um, right, let's have a look at some more photos so we can just look at some of the sorts of actions that we've really done to focus on, on climate justice. So, you will know that we've had um, a recent series of actions against Barclays. Now, in that, we didn't particularly focus on climate justice, but the year before, we had run a campaign on Racial Justice Sunday. I don't think many people took part in it, but we were able to look at Barclays in relation to uh, racial justice, and I'm just going to show you the um, the poster that we had alongside that one, because it, this is one of the ways in which we could think about bedding racial justice or climate justice into some of the actions that we do. So when we looked at Barclays last year, some of us used this to highlight to people that it's not just around emissions, but it's also about racial justice. And we tied it in with Racial Justice Sunday. So here is the sort of next one we did. The, the, the very obvious work we've been doing around climate justice is, is probably uh, within the last year or so, although a lot of our actions have kind of looked at it, it, within the last year and with COP being in the UK, we began to do more explicit actions. So uh, for those of you who uh, came to an earlier talk where Julie talked about the uh, Camino to COP, that is our pilgrimage when we walked from London to Glasgow last year for the COP, um, she told you quite a lot about it, but what she didn't dwell on was the fact that this was designed as a vehicle to talk about climate justice. And so, um, wherever we went, in the evenings, we would hold gatherings, some larger and some smaller, and we would talk about climate justice. For instance, when we were uh, in Cheadle, we partnered with the uh, ex-bishop of the Solomon Islands, um, and we did a, a talk about the impact of climate change there and about what climate justice was. And this was particularly close to my heart because actually this is, I grew up in these islands. Um, but what he said was really, really, I thought, very powerful. He said, you have so much, even though you feel sometimes that you're poor or in an age of austerity or your services are being cut. When you queue in a hospital, just remember that the people in the Solomon Islands would just want access to a hospital. When you talk about the cuts to education services, there are children that can't access education. And that's a context in which we really need to set our work. It was, it was just incredibly powerful listening to him about how his people wanted basic services and how those basic services were being eroded by climate change. But on top of that, where you see uh, islands like that that disappear, we have to remember that there were people that lived there. Where are they going to go? The land that they can move to belongs to other people. Uh, even if they have some money to go somewhere else, small island nations like that have limited um, 
places where people can go that are, are not, um, say, on the sharp hillsides of uh, the sort of uh, volcanic islands. And it causes conflict over resources. So it's not just, you know, oh, your identity and your island is disappearing. It has a direct result on the lives that, 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 that might not uh, exist because of war. So uh, let's have another a look at another one. These are slightly more recent ones. And so this year we decided that we would look at partnering with, with groups that might be working in this field. And so one of them is uh, Debt for Climate. You can look them up and they work on um, the idea that the debt that developing countries have is really impeding their ability to um, pay off their debt. And one of the things that that group did, that's us outside um, parliament, is this. Um, and it was actually quite a powerful action. And the police were so bemused by this and that they, they didn't do anything. They just sat and watched it. So what you can see is inside parliament, the group uh, sitting there in protest um, and chanting and singing and getting some photographs uh, around that. So that is another action idea. And then let's have a, have a look for just a, a few more. Um, we, you, you will have heard, um, if you came to earlier sessions, you'll have heard Jonathan Sterling talking about how we went to the Lambeth Conference of Anglican Bishops. Well, the message there was largely around climate justice. And we decided that the time had come to stop pussyfooting around this and to actually be really blunt in our banner. And we've taken that banner out a couple of other times since. But maybe that's one of the things we should do, look at the messaging on our banners to make sure that they um, that they reflect elements of, of, of climate justice. And we joined the um, climate justice rallies that um, took place last Saturday. Again, in pursuit of climate justice, we decided that uh, we took that climate inaction equals racism and we took deeds not words because of course part of this whole campaign is about our government's words saying that we're wonderful of it, at this and of course we're not. Um, we have been joining uh, other XR groups in London in this and there's um, the last one is today because you will know that um, COP27 has been extended today and so we've been in vigil outside Parliament at, for an hour every lunchtime throughout COP and the purpose of this is not just to simply say um, COP is important but actually to recognise the intersectionality between human rights and um, the climate crisis. And we've been talking to people and praying about the need for civil society and um, activists to have a space in this debate if we're ever to achieve a just solution to the climate crisis. Um, I think they've been doing a similar vigil in Bristol, parallel vigil, so that you know is another avenue people can take uh, their own action wherever they are when we do these sorts of things. Um, and here we go. This is my last suggestion of things that, 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 we can, that we can do ourselves in terms of climate justice. This is, uh, this is a photograph taken by an XR photographer uh, on one of the marches, which was not to do with climate justice, in fact was to do with um, stopping uh, fossil fuel funding. But it became an opportunity, certainly for me, to talk about something that was really important to me, 
uh, and I took a climate justice sign and that's what I talk to people about. So one last slide because I'm just going to let us sit for a couple of minutes with this whole thoughts and then I'm just going to open this up to the floor. So here's our, our last slide. This came from the very, very first uh, XR action I ever attended back in April 2019. But I think that encapsulates um, kind of why I think that this issue is important. We're here not, and we take this action not just for ourselves, but for all life on earth. And not all life on earth faces this struggle in an equal way. And it's in recognizing that inequality, actually, uh, not just inequality, in inequity, that I think drives this fight for climate justice. If we recognize the inequity of the situation, then as people of faith, we're called to bring about a more just and equal way of dealing with what we do.